For the sake of labeling myself to establish relatability and to present myself as a lovable but nerdy protagonist, I'll say I've always been a toy guy. That is, I like toys. Something about the tactile nature of a well-designed action figure, especially if there are multiple articulation points, rubs me just right. By contrast, my hardworking former Marine, heavily Arabic-accented dad was a football guy. Now, I love my dad, but I grew to hate football. He'd spend hours watching games on Sunday, going so far as to say we wouldn't be doing anything as a family until his games were over. So I'd sit on the living room floor, obsessing over stories in my head with little plastic players. But football wasn't the real problem, and toys were never the real solution. To this day, G.I. Joe is my plastic crack of choice. Now, I was too young for the original 12-inch G.I. Joe to lock me in his kung fu grip, but I was ripe for exploitation when Star Wars set the new small-scale standard for action figures and vehicles. And when G.I. Joe returned and brought Cobra with him in 1982, I ditched the straight-armed, straight-laced Star Wars toys for the posability and possibilities presented in four catchy words... Swivel arm battle grip. <laughs> oh, yeah. The first time I realized I could make G.I. Joe kneel and hold a rifle in both hands, I mean, I went ape shit over G.I. Joe. I spent every dime I had. I begged at every birthday. I hinted at every Christmas for the little three and three quarters inch man of action with the rubber band sternum. And I got him in spades. Oh, I was all in. I collected the comics written by Larry Hama and drawn by Herb Trimpey. I bought the board game. I watched the cartoons. He'll fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Real American Hero. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe is the code name for America's highly trained special missions force. Its purpose, to defend human freedom against Cobra, a ruthless terrorist organization determined to rule the world. He never gives up. He'll stay till the fight's won. G.I. Joe will dare. G.I. Joe... G.I. Joe! My friends would come over, and we'd spend an hour picking our teams, though we usually quit after that. See, it was a foregone conclusion that whoever picked Snake Eyes and or Storm Shadow would prevail despite any F-14 sky strikers or massive amounts of plastic artillery. Sure, I had a transformer, or eight, and I tried out whatever random toy lines I could get my hands on, but for me, G.I. Joe was where it was at. And it wasn't even about playing with them. It was about having them in hand and letting my imagination run wild. I spent more time thinking of ways to play than actually playing but that worked for me. Now you know, but knowing is half the battle. (laughs) One of the things I loved about toys in the 80s was the send-away promotions. When you had to save up your G.I. Joe flag points for a Sergeant Slaughter, or a militarized William the Refrigerator Perry figure, I was in nerd heaven. Please allow six to eight weeks for processing and delivery once we receive your order. Waiting never hurt so good. After three weeks, my heart would start pounding every time I went to the curb to check our mailbox. But after six, I'd consider sending a letter to the company asking if I'd been stiffed or if my order had been lost in the mail. By eight weeks, I weeks I was a basket case until that magic day when a tiny white box addressed to Mr. Nasser Helloa would arrive, stuffed carelessly with a toy I'd likely never buy in the store, but was certainly glad to get for free. 
Mainly, it was the getting of something delivered to my home for me, which made me feel like Christmas come early every time. When I was 15 and really getting into the swing of high school, I began to abandon toys because girls. <laughs> I began to like them as more than Princess Leia stand-ins. They thought I was nice. I thought my toy collection would do little to gain any points to put me over the just friends line. So I packed most of them up and put them into my parents' storage shed, lovingly called the dungeon, safely sequestered from sight and mind. For most of the 90s, I was free of action figures. Instead, my vice was video games. Also not attractive to most of the girls I thought I liked but slightly less stigmatizing because they could be stored in the same shelf as books or CDs. Camouflage. <laughs> Yet somehow, despite the video games, and because she is just that compelling, I met and married the love of my life. We were hitched in 98, and for the first 10 years of our marriage, toys were out of the question. We started with a tiny condo, very little money, and newlywed bliss. She wanted to travel, so after I learned to let her handle the budget, that's exactly what we did with our shared spare dollars. Eventually, our jobs started paying us more. As dinks, that is dual income, no kids, we were pretty much able to get whatever we wanted, including our first personal computer. See, I grew up in a PC-free home, so it was huge to finally have my own portal to the World Wide Web, and it was there among the ones and zeros masquerading as pictures and paranoia and nostalgia, that I was reminded by those like me of what I had left behind in the wake of my diminishing youth. Now, I believed I was done with toys for the rest of my days. I'd outgrown them, you see. Certainly, they didn't hold any appeal for a man who had kissed a girl. I was almost free of them. But as Larry Hama used to write in the G.I. Joe comics, almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. <laughs> in 2007, G.I. Joe's Real American Hero Line celebrated its 25th anniversary. Toys began appearing on the shelves at Target and Walmart in the exact same packaging as the toys I used to buy in the 80s. Nostalgia hit me hard. But I resisted the urge to buy anything and felt pretty good about it for a while, but the toys just kept on coming. More and more figures of my favorite characters, and then a friend bought me one of the graphic novels chronicling the origins of the indomitable snake eyes. I turned to the internet, tracking down more comics I'd missed, which led me to the vast fan sites I never knew existed. The G.I. Joe line I thought had died in the early 90s had been going on without me for years, and in my Google-fueled research, oh, I saw it all, laid out before me in plastic glory. Reviews, forums, a fan club, even homemade comics using the toys as props. <laughs> Extensive, intriguing comics that didn't have to play by the toy company rules of engagement. One day, I bought a four-pack of figures just to see how they felt. The next day, I bought another, and then some more. And then I was buying the old stuff online because they were getting cleared out to make room for the new stuff. It was so easy to do, and there was HisTank.com and GeneralsJoes.com full of actual people who had been doing it for years, and they seemed cool. I mean, how can guys called Darkwind, Jimbotron, and Gyra Viper not be cool? And hey, I was just buying toys. It wasn't like I was buying drugs or hookers. Toys, man. Toys. <laughs> but it's never one toy, is it? In my internet scouring, I came across the rebirth of that big lug I'd known about but never really had a serious relationship with. He-Man. The He-Man and the Masters of the Universe toy line was a contemporary and rival of G.I. Joe in the 80s, but I never got on board. My parents refused to buy them for me. 
I guess they felt weird giving their kids half-naked bodybuilders with names like He-Man, Ram Man, and Fisto. <laughs> All equipped with not much more than loincloth swords and glistening physiques. Though to my mind, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe seem to be built the same as the football players my dad liked, but with real motivations. The fate of planet Eternia is a far more noble cause than a Super Bowl ring. While I like the variety of monsters and characters in the He-Man line, I never like how stiff they seemed, with only five points of articulation like the old Star Wars toys. After G.I. Joe, He-Man seemed to step backwards, so I left He-Man on the shelves back then. Today, He-Man has undergone a makeover, becoming much more detailed and articulated in the process. <laughs> Definitely appealing to my tastes. This time, Mattel, the company famous for Barbie, decided to try an online-only approach and really bring He-Man into the future. Masters of the Universe Classics is like a cheese of the month club. You buy a subscription to guarantee your figures so you don't need to worry about not getting everything, but they won't tell you every figure you'll get before you sign up. It's a surprise, like some of the free send-away figures were in the 80s. Plus, shipping and handling, the subscription locks you in for only about 600 bucks for a whole year. By the power of Grayskull, who wouldn't sign up for that? <sighs> Reading it back, I can hardly believe it, and I'm living it. The line started in 2009, but I ordered my first subscription in 2011, the year after my son was born. Perhaps it was a last-ditch effort to hold on to something of my own youth. I have a second child now, a daughter, and things are changing for us. Money is a bit tighter. Time is a bit shorter. The reality of it all hit me hard last February, when my dad passed away suddenly from a massive stroke. I'm 39 now and beginning to feel like I should put away childish things, but I'm afraid if I do, I'll lose a part of myself that I've always liked, the part that can just look at a toy and dream up years of fantastic history and backstory and heroic drama. The realities of life and death seem so much more manageable as long as that part of me can stay alive. So, I try to justify my purchases by doing something other than putting them on a shelf, though I do have a shelf. I open them, and I pose them, <laughs> and I take pictures of them, and I make my own comics with them. Yes. <laughs> For Comic-Con 2012, I spent 200 bucks to make a tiny print run to hand out. I gave one to Larry Hama and a few to the guys at Hasbro, but it was the original artist of G.I. Joe, Herb Trimpey, that really made my year. When he saw my comic, he pulled out his iPhone and showed me pictures he'd taken of his toys. We shared a moment. He was stoked and gave me a poster he was selling, signing it, To Nos, You Are Right. <laughs> I guess we agreed on a few things. Of course, the kids don't get to play with daddy's toys yet. <laughs> but I don't really think they're interested in them. Turns out, I'm still their favorite action figure. For now. That was Nasalewa, everybody.